situation, but we want to be really clear that that's not where the fight started and that's definitely not where the fight is going to end. So we just have a couple of speakers. Um, Holly is going to just talk about uh, the event a bit and then we have a word from Teddy as well, which is great. And then we're just going to stand here and play some really red tunes because it's our space and we're not going to leave and I suppose, you know, we're not going to, it's our public space so we don't have to be afraid and I suppose we're making a stand about it.
that the trans community stands in solidarity with our LGBTQ plus siblings. And we also stand in solidarity in condemning what happened in the Phoenix Park in July. Um, this is horrendous and horrific, and as mentioned, we should be able to walk safely without thinking about who we are, or being targeted because of our identity and who we are. Um, so the, the sad news is that homophobia and transphobia is alive and well in Ireland. Um, and I, something that I knew anyway from my work with Tenny, but that has been graphically demonstrated in the, in the last month. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit, uh, my perspective is from, is from working around transphobic hate crimes and transphobic hate incidents, so I'm going to speak a little bit about that and kind of where we're coming from and why we, would, why we think hate crime legislation is urgently needed in this country. Um, so first of all, I have a, a very um, scrappy speech that I kind of threw together, so. Um, okay, so last year was a very important one for the LGBT community in Ireland. We passed um, the marriage referendum, it was amazing. We also brought in gender recognition legislation, which meant that Ireland is now one of six countries in the world in which gender recognition legislation is based on self-determination, which basically means that a citizen of the Irish state can say, my gender is either male or female, and no one else needs to say anything, that they can just determine their own gender, which is amazing and really progressive. And it's a really amazing message to send to people that your identity is valid and you do not need a third party to tell you who you are, to confirm your identity. And I think that was an amazing message that was sent to the Irish people and to the trans citizens specifically. And I think we have an opportunity to lead the world in terms of LGBT rights. And I think one of the ways that we can, we can build on what, what happened last year is to bring in progressive hate crime legislation, especially around LGBT identity. So I, I'm, going to, I'm going to give you some statistics, but I will try and make it quick and interesting. Um, but it, it is important, I think, to talk about this. Um, the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights launched a groundbreaking, groundbreaking report called Being Trans in the European Union in 2014. And the report points to how trans people experience frequent discrimination and harassment and draws upon the responses to FRA's wider EU LGBT survey. So according to the results of this report, Ireland holds a really ignoble distinction of having the second highest prevalence of hate-motivated violence in the last 12 months in EU member states. We're only um, the only state that has a higher rate of hate-motivated violence is Lithuania. And our 13% is much higher than the EU average rate percent. This is kind of, it's grim, basically, that, that, that we're doing so poorly for a country that has been so progressive in other ways. Um, we published a report called Speaking, Tenny published a report called Speaking from the Margins, which was about trans mental health and well-being in Ireland in 2013. And the 164 respondents to that survey, of those 164 people, 84% of those people had heard that trans people aren't normal. 36% um, had experienced physical intimidation or threats, and 36% had also experienced sexual harassment because of their trans identity. So there's a real problem in Ireland. There's, I would suggest that Ireland is a low level homophobic and transphobic country, and we need to change those attitudes. Um, we have a campaign called the Stop Transphobia and Discrimination campaign, in which we collect data on hate motivated incidents and hate crimes. We're a civil society organization, and we're the ones who are collecting this information so that we can try and affect change and bring about hate crime legislation in this country. But it falls to us as a civil society organisation to do this work, which is vitally needed in order to um, validate the need for hate crime legislation. So the start campaign was launched because Tenny was receiving anecdotal reports from trans people about pervasive violence harassment and discrimination that they had endured. However, we didn't know the extent or the shape of the problem, and the Stop Campaign's objectives were to provide a snapshot of the experiences trans people face to raise awareness about transphobic violence in Ireland. Um, we knew that trans people were not com comfortable reporting incidents to Angarda Giacona, 
and we wanted to enable the trans community to report hate crimes and incidents in a safe environment and without fear of ridicule or secondary victimisation. Until this point, transphobic hate crime was not recorded in Ireland and it was not viewed as an issue. And I would suggest the same is true of homophobic hate crime. I know that homophobia and transphobia are now included in the Gardaí's Pulse system, which is their way of classifying crimes. But as far as I understand, no crimes have ever been classified as homophobic or transphobic in the Pulse system. So while that's progress, it's not really doing anything. And there's no incentive for the Gardaí to record anything as a homophobic or transphobic hate crime because there's no harsher sentencing, there's no different sen sentencing that can be applied to an offender because of that. So there's absolutely no motivation for the Gardaí to record things accurately. Transphobic incidents and homophobic incidents have a negative impact on the health and well-being of, pe of people. It negatively impacts the border community as there is a fear or expectation that people will be victims of crimes or incidents. And internalised homophobia or transphobia means that some people will feel as though they deserve it or that that violence is normal. And we know that people do not report crimes or incidents. And the reasons for not reporting included trauma, fear of being outed or re-victimisation, shame, isolation or disconnection, not knowing how or where to report, access, not knowing of ways to report, and apathy, thinking that nothing will happen, and internalised homophobia or transphobia because they doubt the severity of the incident. They don't think it's serious enough to tell someone about. This needs to change. Like, this is not acceptable. I can, I can stand here and quote a lot of statistics and stuff, and I think it is very important that we do need that kind of data collection in order to affect change. But what we also collected was qualitative information and actual trans people's stories of, of what happened to them. So I'm going to share just a, a couple of pieces of information that were shared with us in stories. And it, it's grim, but this is the reality of it. So one person told us that the incidents float around in my head all the time, causing anxiety and panic attacks. I wake up at night and this is going around in my head. I should be able to go about my day-to-day -day business in peace. Another person told us that they stopped transition, attempted suicide, and killed their self-confidence. And I have a, a, a really disturbing description of something that happened to someone. Um, this is a 19 year old queer person who said there was a group of about 20 men with two in the middle cheering them on. The two were fighting with knives. I made an effort to avoid them, but they noticed me. The two with knives came at me and the others were cheering them on. They were shouting at me, asking if I was a boy or a girl, calling me things like dyke, it. They made swipes at me with the knives, but missed me on purpose. They decided they would find out if I had a dick or tits by ripping off my shirt. I managed to get away with my shirt intact. I ran home and they followed me halfway and stopped when they saw me put a key in the door. And this, I would say, in my experience, is not that unusual. I think there, that trans people face an inordinate amount of street harassment and physical assault. So, I mean, I shouldn't even have to say this, and I think we all know it, but there is no justification for violence against anyone. There is none. Your, your sexuality is no reason. Your gender is no reason. Your gender expression, how you dress, how you act, how you walk, how you speak, is no reason. Your HIV status is no reason. Whether you're a sex worker or not is no reason. There is no reason why someone should have suffered the violence that Marston experienced in July in the park beside us. I'm very struck by some of the comments that have been made on the few reports that have been written about what happened in the park and people asking questions I'm blaming the victim, asking why he was in the park, what he was doing in the park at the time he was there. How did his attackers know he was gay? Well, fuck the people who are asking those questions. It 
doesn't matter why he was there. There is no justification for what happened to him. And asking those questions is putting blame on someone who is brave enough to come forward and speak about what happened to him. And it's shameful. Okay, so I, th I think what we need to think about what we can do as a community. I think we also need to think about are we a community? Do we regard everyone equally? We spoke a lot about equality last year, and I think now we need to put that in, into place and actually work on making equality happen in people's lived experiences and their own realities every day. Legislation is really important, but we need to change people's day-to-day -day lives so that we can, we can see the impact of that legislation in people's lived experience. So we've got to challenge transphobia and homophobia at every juncture that we can if it is safe for you to do so. We cannot allow a culture of transphobia and homophobia to exist. We need to be strong and we need to challenge it where we see it. We need positive visibility. That was great. Thanks. <laughs> We need positive visibility of LGBT people, LGBTQ plus people, in all of their amazing, beautiful diversity, in all of their amazing, beautiful validity. Everyone's experience is valid, everyone is equal, and true equality means that everyone is equal. Whether you want to get married or not, you're equal, as equally part of our LGBTQ plus community. And obviously, if you do want to get married, that's really valid and beautiful too. Like, I'm not in any way <laughs> suggesting it's not. Um, we need robust hate crime legislation. Um, LGBT people are not expressly protected under any hate crime legislation in the Republic of Ireland. We have no hate crime legislation in Ireland. And the only thing we have is this thing called the Incitement to Hatred Act of 1989, which has never been successfully used to prosecute anywhere. So it's useless. It sits there and does nothing. We've got to continue to gather data. Um, that's work that we will continue to do in Tenney. It's work that, that my colleagues in Glen are also very much involved in. Because the guard they are not collecting or publishing data on homophobic or transphobic incidents, so we need to do it. We need to work with the guard they and train them and the other services that victims may access to make sure that they are LGBT plus, Q plus friendly. And that when people do need them, that they are able to give a good, appropriate response, because they are failing us in this regard at the moment. And I think we need to build relationships between police services and the criminal justice system and the LGBTQ plus community. Because from our work, we know that only 20% of our respondents reported crimes to the police, and those that did, only 7% only of them felt that the police were supporting. So we've got to build a relationship and make that change. And I think that by standing here today and seeing you all here, is very encouraging in the hopes that maybe that will happen soon. So thank you.